A little bit of background on this particular presentation. I'd like to convey greetings from the main authors of this presentation today, Simpson Garfinkel and John Abab. Uh, due to unavoidable constraints, they are not able to participate um, in the event today. Um, so except for a few introductory comments that I'll make in the next couple of minutes, I will be presenting material that they developed and that was presented originally in a uh, census program management review a few weeks ago. And so at the end, we will have their contact information. If you're interested in details, we'll be covering only a very light amount of uh, some very rich and very deep technical material today. Um, and so I'll try to answer a few of those questions, but you may especially want to follow up with them if you're interested in a lot of details. Um, in addition, I'll add thanks to Catherine Allen West, um, as Maggie was mentioning a moment ago, but also with thanks is a, a corresponding assignment. Catherine has available some information regarding a federal register notice. If you've not had a chance to see that, she has that electronically available, and both David and I are going to be saying a few words about that uh, federal register notice at the end. The deadline for responding to that is November 8th. We heartily encourage everybody either here in the room or uh, listening online uh, to participate and provide constructive responses. We'll say more about constructive response at the end of this presentation, uh, but very much encourage you to uh, follow up with that. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of general background uh, that in many ways is echoing a number of things we were hearing both in Alfonso's original presentation today um, and uh, the first panel discussion is that, <laughs> excuse me, anytime <coughs> You have any large-scale statistical program. <coughs> In-depth work with that requires an organization to carry out a complex balance of multiple dimensions um, that can generally be categorized in at least three groups. The first one is quality. That includes notions of accuracy that we'll be emphasizing later today, but also includes other dimensions that we were hearing considered earlier this morning, for example, relevance and timeliness. Second category is risk. Um, that includes the type of disclosure risk that we're going to be talking about today and a number of other dimensions of risk, for example, uh, system performance. And then third, we always have to spend a lot of time thinking about cost. That includes both the cash cost of carrying out a certain set of operations, but also involves other scarce resources that we have. For example, available timeline, keep with some of the comments that we were hearing in the previous question session about deadlines and other things like that. We'll say more about that at the end. In addition, David and I had a chance to converse a little bit about our respective presentations previously, and I think he's going to be touching on a number of those issues as well. Um, a second point uh, that I'd like to emphasize is that like most large-scale methodological innovations that you see anywhere, either in the statistical or the broader methodology world, changes that we see in disclosure avoidance procedures require us to work at an absolutely fascinating intersection of three general areas. One is what you might call general principle science. We'll see a little bit of that that we'll touch on very briefly today. Second dimension involves technological implementation. It's great to have ideas, and it's terribly important to have the scientific insights that are offered in these areas. And then you go from that to saying, and therefore, here is how we are going to have a production system that meets those quality criteria of quality, risk, and cost I referred to a moment ago in a scaled uh, form. And then the third dimension, which is also terribly important, is to have very careful attention to practical impact um, that we end up having for any type of production system, in this case, to close closure avoidance uh, system. Um, it's reflected both in a combination of empirical results and also in user behavior. And some of that ties in with what Maggie was referring to a couple of minutes ago in terms of the quality of the work uh, that we end up having and the resulting data that our, our users are able to use. Again, we'll cover all of that at the end a little bit in my presentation, but also I think Dave and some of our other speakers are also going to be following up on that as well. In keeping with Al's comments at the start in his keynote address, uh, disclosure avoidance system is um, intended to ensure that the uh, 2020 decennial data products meet legal requirements related to Title 13. Um, and that is the fundamental title under which we are authorized to collect the data, but also have a corresponding obligation uh, to protect the privacy of those data. So in particular, this disclosure avoidance system, as I'll be describing it in very brief form today, uh, is intended to prevent improper disclosures of data about individuals or establishments um, in our 2020 products. Um, the longer version of this paper that was presented at the 
uh, Census Program Management Review covered four main concepts. Uh, purpose, what do we, why do we need a new disclosure avoidance system? Notions related to noise injection and differential privacy, state of the project, and some uh, uh, forward-looking statements. We are going to keep that relatively short, in particular those last two elements today, um, but you're welcome to look online. Uh, all those materials are available online in a great deal of depth. So instead, we're going to focus on, first of all, what's the purpose of a disclosure avoidance system? Why do we care? And the fundamental concept uh, that we uh, motivates our work with disclosure avoidance system in general and also the version of it that we have developed for 2020 is focused on a notion of, quote, database reconstruction. Basic idea uh, is displayed in this very simple uh, graph here. On the left-hand side, we have respondent data. Those are the data that Al mentioned before that we are pledged <coughs> to protect. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, we have the published summary data uh, that we're going to have. And the concern that is expressed um, and summarized with the term, quote, database reconstruction is to what extent and in what ways is it possible, here's the risk, that the published summary data will allow somebody not to make aggregate inferences, that's what we want them to make uh, from the published summary data, but instead to make statements about the underlying respondent data at a micro level. That's the concern. And so we can visualize that as saying that if we saw those published data, could we, quote, reconstruct, unquote, the original responses. Um, the general notion of that goes beyond simply saying, is there one single reconstruction? But a crucial fact that we'll be developing in the next few minutes is that in most cases, and we'll put some footnotes on that in a moment, in most cases we in fact have many different possible, quote, database reconstructions, unquote, that could be essentially purported to be developed from a set of published summary data. If we have a whole lot of those, and in some ways we don't have too much in the way of information to allow people to distinguish among them, you might say we have a very large haystack and we have one needle buried in that haystack, and so, quote, our data are relatively safe, unquote. On the other hand, uh, if, and we'll get to why, we have to worry about the second case in a moment, if, in fact, uh, we have that uh, needle, in fact, very prominent within that haystack, it's not in some ways buried, um, then we have to worry about that a lot. That's a rough idea that we have behind database reconstruction. We'll start with a very simple case. This is intentionally oversimplified just to begin developing the idea. Suppose we have, for the moment, a publication based on some decennial census data that involve only two attributes. Uh, the first one is age. Either an individual is under 18 or they're greater than or equal to 18, in other words, voting age. And we also have them classified as being in just one of three different race categories. And suppose we have the very simple publication that we have on the right, perhaps for a certain block, that involves 10 persons living in that block. And all we report are the margins, simply saying age is less than 18 for four individuals, greater than or equal to 18 for six. And in the same way, we have the distribution of the race classifications, as we have indicated at the bottom of uh, the bottom right-hand side of the slide. Then in principle, a possible reconstruction of the original microdata, again looking only at the two attributes, would be what you have on the left-hand side. Maybe we have, for example, four individuals who are in race one, and the figures that we have there for relatively large and relatively small figures there are representing individuals respectively who are greater than or equal to 18 or less than 18. That's the notion of reconstruction. Now, as a footnote, you will also see discussion of, quote, re-identification, unquote, that would show up. Idea of re-identification is suppose you carry out that reconstruction and you say, here is a certain household. That much is reconstruction. If you then say, and that's the Elting family, that's re-identification. So that's a distinction you will see drawn in some of the literature between reconstruction and re-identification. The worry is, when we focus on reconstruction is in some ways that's an initial high risk step toward re-identification. We're going to spoke almost all the attention today on reconstruction. First possible reconstruction is what I displayed a moment ago and that we now have grayed out, but that's not the only possible reconstruction. We in fact have other many, a uh, large number of additional reconstructions that could be carried out, including the example that we have that we call R2 here, in which we might have, for example, four individuals all under the age of 18 
in race group one, four individuals uh, over the age of 18 in race group two, four, uh, two individuals uh, over the age of 18 in race group three. Turns out that when you go through all of the resulting combinatorics for that, even in this relatively simple case, it turns out you have over 600,000 possible reconstructions based on this very simple classification that you have here. And consequently, we end up saying, if we lived in this nice, low-dimensional world, and we could stay there, then we really don't have too much to worry about in terms of reconstruction. The problem is we live in a more complex world than that. And in particular, for the 2010 decennial, so we're using that in many ways as the anchor, the baseline for what we have here. In the 2010 decennial, in a certain sense, well, we did have 10 questions asked, but for an individual, we effectively have six different attributes attached to them, things like age, race, and so on like that. Um, when you go through the combinatorics for that work, <coughs> It turns out that you get a variant on what uh, mathematical statisticians in the last 20 some years have been referring to as the quote, curse of dimensionality, unquote. Essentially, the dimensionality means that you no longer can say, I have a very large, relatively large haystack in which I'm bearing a needle. But in fact, you have major problems attached to that. Here's the major problem based again on 2010 data. <clears throat> um, we have, for the purpose of discussion here, three different files that we're going to contemplate. Uh, the first one is the one that's absolutely crucial in terms of redistricting. It's referred to as the PL94-171. took me a year at the Census Bureau to memorize uh, that label. Um, bottom line there is we have over 2.7 billion, that's billion with a B, cells represented in that. It's because of the, the very fine level information that we are obligated based on the, um, based on the legal obligations that I was referring to before. We also have two other files that were published in um, 2010, uh, balance of summary file one, about 2.8 billion, um, and then summary file two with just over two billion. Again, huge numbers of cells attached to each of those. And on the other hand, <clears throat> if you say, wait a minute, where did that come from? Uh, it came from a little over 300 million persons for whom we were collecting information. Uh, six attributes, as I was saying before, that we, we were referring to. So you say, wait a minute, uh, we have effectively the collected statistics in this sense, about 1.8 billion um, numbers, uh, figures that we have. But we have effectively, in parallel with that, uh, something over 7 billion, effectively, equations. Go back to algebra, and you say, wait a minute, I have... Uh, essentially, um, 1.8 billion unknowns, I have 7.7 .7 billion equations, and pretty quickly you say I have an overdetermined system, I in fact am at serious risk of, in fact, being able to quote, reconstruct, unquote, that. There's a whole lot of detail behind that, but that's roughly the intuitive idea. Again, the dimensionality is the crucial factor uh, in that. This has been well known for a number of decades, and as a result of that, over the course of time, uh, the Census Bureau has made major efforts to try to address this. In 2010, two primary tools that were used were aggregation and swapping. And for 2020, the focus is instead going to be on noise injection and a related set of tools that are referred to as differential privacy. Um, the basic idea behind noise injection is that, in effect, you're going to take the information that you have at that fine uh, level of aggregation, and you're going to, quote, perturb it, unquote, in certain types of structured <coughs> ways but not the same kind of structure that we saw with perturbation in 2010. Differential privacy, then, is a body of tools. I won't go into the details of it here. But the basic idea it's, is that it's a way for us to effectively control the resulting trade-offs we have between the two crucial factors that Maggie was referring to in her introductory remarks. One is, how well are we protecting privacy? Again, dealing with the needle in the haystack idea that we referred to before. Effectively, by injecting noise, we're no longer having people even sure what is the needle that they're finding in the haystack if they find it. And on the other hand, the question of accuracy. We have to have a high, high level of utility for certain purposes of the data we put out. That's the whole reason we're doing it to begin with. Um, you will typically see in this literature a set of trade-offs that are characterized by the type of curve that I was displaying here. And I won't go again into the details of it, but I'll highlight three main points. First of all, if you were to live in the upper right-hand corner 
of this graph. You were living on a point in, in that curve, up near that upper right-hand corner. That's essentially a place at which you were adding very little noise. So you're back in your exercise I was describing a moment ago about we're really not doing a very good job of hiding the needle in the haystack anymore. So you have effectively a high level of privacy loss, but on the other hand, uh, you are in fact providing uh, data at a relatively fine level with a very high level of accuracy. On the other hand, if you live in the far left-hand corner, you effectively are in, in uh, the opposite situation. You've, you've in fact prov uh, provided a very high degree of protection a lot of noise in your data. You provide a high level of protection, but on the other hand, you have very poor quality data, very low level of accuracy for the information uh, that you're providing. Um, differential privacy is a set of tools that we have for uh, helping us to understand those trade-offs. Obviously, you'd like to live somewhere between those two extremes, and there's a lot of further information um, that um, a, lot, a lot of further information that we can consider in that. Um, let's have a quick show of hands here. How many of you in the audience are primarily survey methodologists? Any? Okay, see a few hands. Let me mention something in passing. The assessment that we have about where ought we to be living on this curve depends in a very fundamental way on trying to understand effectively the utility that is attached both to individuals, individuals all 308 million or so of us as of 2010, that we attach to certain types of privacy protections, and on the other hand, the utility also that we attribute. Uh, to a certain level of accuracy of the information that we're distributing. Um, one of many areas of research that would be extremely valuable for um, uh, us to have further insights from our colleagues in the academic community as well as the private sector and, and in the government is to understand more about ways in which we can elicit a clear understanding of utility in these very case-specific cases. It's effectively what the Federal Register Notice that I referenced before is trying to get at in terms of surface and use cases. But there's also some very interesting methodological issues related to this. Um, for example, about a dozen years ago, Tony O'Hagan and many co-authors, co-editors, had a really interesting book on elicitation of utility functions and priors. How do we take those sorts of notions, and also some related <clears throat> me, some related uh, software has been developed by David Spiegelhalter and others. How do we take either those tools or related concepts and try to use those in a structured way to in fact take notional development of use cases and in fact get ourselves with much better insights about where we want to live on this curve. That's just one of many areas of both methodological and also engineering insights that we would very much benefit from. The resulting disclosure avoidance system, once the decision is made about where we want to live on that curve, um, is summarized very briefly in this, uh, in, in this graph. Um, it's essentially a variant on what I was displaying before, but with a little more detail. Idea, once again, is in the red area that we have on the left. These are where we have confidential data inside the Census Bureau, the original decennial response file, as well as uh, various levels of unedited and then subsequently edited files. On the right, we have our, our released for, um, information that we have. Again, for example, our PL94171 data, as well as uh, um, uh, the um, uh, supplementary files one and two, and prospectively special tabulations as well. And again, sitting in the middle, we have a disclosure avoidance system. There's a, a fundamental tuning constant that's referred to as epsilon that's crucial to um, uh, differential privacy calculations. De making decisions on that then effectively ends up saying, how do we tune that middle box that we have in our work? Now, there are both advantages and disadvantages of differential privacy approaches relative to the swapping that was used in 2010. Uh, for example, uh, privacy guarantees can be much more quote, tunable and provable. Uh, they're also in some sense future use. They are not uh, some sense assessed relative to what type of external data are currently available in the outside environment. And that's a crucial factor. If you go back through much of the disclosure literature over the 30-some years, uh, often much of that is essentially conditional upon what else is available um, already in the external environment. Um, privacy guarantees can be explainable um, and, and placed in the public domain uh, and provides a reasonable degree of protection against database reconstruction. But there are disadvantages. Um, and in particular, the entire country effectively has to be processed once to be the most efficient that you possibly can be in there. Um, and also there's a set of calculations referred to as a privacy loss budget every time we release <coughs> additional information we're essentially having to charge it to that. And if we have a finite budget attached to that, we have to be very careful about that. Going back to saying a little bit more about engagement with all of our colleagues um, in academia, the private sector, um, and other government agencies, the intention is to make the entire disclosure avoidance system place it in the public domain. Open source uh, data, we very much, excuse me, open source code, we very much hope 
uh, that our colleagues will in fact look at those and provide, I, we hope, a whole lot of improvements and that will found, form a basis for a great deal of enrichment of the disclosure avoidance literature. In addition, as we heard referenced before, uh, we do ultimately have data, Census Bureau data, excuse me, decennial census data released uh, into the public domain, in particular 1940 data at present are now fully in the public domain. As a result of that, we very much hope people will be able to use either this disclosure avoidance system or anything else that they may wish to have. Use that, apply it to the 1940 data. We hope that provides a very rich test bed for a very energetic discussion of a whole lot of pluses and minuses and again, how we can improve these data over time. Uh, finally, as I mentioned at the start, there's a federal register notice that has a deadline of comment for November 8th. We heartily encourage everybody here to respond, and in particular respond with concrete use cases to help us understand as much as we possibly can about where you view high priorities to be uh, in terms of particular data products that are prospectively coming out of the 2020 census. Thank you. <laughs>